Okay, so um, within today's class, I think um, to help make sense of some of the items I'm going to talk that we'll see in those models, I'm going to introduce um, two sets of material related to Java. Um, and uh, we'll see aspects of those components used in the successive models we go through. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give uh, two lectures, uh, one of them uh, briefer and one of them longer, that will hope, hopefully help make sense of uh, the, uh, some of the ways in which any logic works and ways in which um, the, the particulars of the models operate that we'll be looking at. Okay, so um, the first uh, item, which is uh, shorter, going to be talking about this notion of collections in Java, um, where collections hold a number of uh, particular sub-items um, that will typically be uh, members of some class. For example, you might have a collection of people, um, you might have a collection of, of deer, and um, those would be agents in your model and the collection would hold them. And as we'll see, there's a variety of types of collections with different trade-offs and different sorts of information that they retain and capture. So um, I'd like to introduce some of the collections that are available to you in Java because when you're building a model, one of the more common needs is to, to capture information about sets of uh, sets or other sequences of of uh, individuals, say agents within your model. So it turns out that uh, Java cre uh, maintains a substantive hierarchy of collections, and we'll talk about what it mean what I mean by a hierarchy later in this class. It's, it's what's called a subtyping hierarchy, um, and it would be very useful for you to understand what that means. But suffice it to say that when we're thinking about having a collection of items, where the type of the item information about a, groups of items in different ways, um, treating them as a set, treating them as a queue where there's some ordering and they advance through the queue as items from the head of the queue are successively processed, treating them as a list that you can walk backwards or forward with, um, and treating as a map, a map from a, a key, maybe it's a person's name or an ID or a, uh, the name of a, of a state to information value V um, associated with that key. So there's a variety of things called uh, maps and hash tables and so on that help us with those processes. Now all these types of collections, it turns out, um, can be iterated over. In other words, we can loop over each of the items in a given collection. And that's one of the main things you do with collections. One of the reasons I'm talking about this in Java is that uh, any logic actually maintains what are called collection objects. And they're denoted in this sort of uh, triangular fashion. Um, and they're called a collection. And you can add a collection from the, um, from the palette when you're building up a model. It's distinguished from other types of variables such as variables and parameters by the fact that we're storing a variety of, of, of items within that. And uh, any logic makes uh, provides as a choice for a given collection what sort of collection it is. So is it an array list? Is it a linked list? Is it a hash map? And we'll talk about what some of these things mean. Okay, so, so these collections store sets or groups of information on particular items. In this case, um, they're going to store information on various persons that are children of this person who's depicted. Okay. We're going to go through this model a bit later. It's, it's a stylized model, but it exhibits some uh, features that are worth discussing. Um, we probably won't spend that much time on it, but we'll see where this children uh, information is, is used and, and how it's maintained. In addition to that, you can define variables within any logic like this dict in the dictionary, um, that are themselves collections. In this case, it's, it's a 
hash table, something there. You give it uh, a reference to a person and it will tell you some value, some double precision plug point value that gives the last time that person was infected. So in other words, it maps from persons to information about the person where the information is when were they last infected. So that's an example of, of a type of collection. It's, it's actually not shown as a collection object here, although in fact it could be. Um, but we may wish for variables such as that. So within this brief talk, I'm going to talk about a variety of types of collections you'll see in Java with an eye towards giving you some sense of sorts of information we maintain and some trade-offs between them. We'll try to look at models which incorporate several of these components over the next couple lectures. Okay. Okay, so common characteristics of any of these collections is a capacity to store information, information on a, on a group of items, a capacity to iterate through these items, say in a loop, and a separation, and I'll talk more about this later in this uh, session, separation of uh, what's called the interface from what's called the implementation. And in other words, um, we may have a notion, an abstract notion of a set that has some contract associated with it. You give this information, it'll give you this, this back. That's what it specifies in the interface. It specifies a contract. And there may be many particular implementations of that contract that are optimized for different circumstances. Like some might maintain more information, some might maintain less information, et cetera. And uh, that information, that a particular implementation will provide an instantiation of this interface, an instantiation of this contract um, with particular characteristics. So they differ in the how, they accomplish the what that's provided by the, that's guaranteed by the interface. In kind of the same way that um, uh, you could have uh, many particular uh, Android phones, all of them running Android, uh, the smartphone operating system, and each of those phones uh, differs in its details, but they all agree to uh, certain guidelines, certain standards about how they interact with Android. Another example would be um, you could go to any post office in the country with a letter with uh, certain stamps on it. And if you know how much it takes to get a letter from here to Canada, with some standard rate, you could go to any post office and mail it. They all adhere to that contract, as it were, that if you give us a letter with these stamps on it, we'll get it to your destination. Even though they may differ in how they get it there. The post office is on an island, maybe it uses a boat to get it to the mainland. Other post offices might be right next to an airport and immediately loaded aboard a plane. They all differ in how they get it there, but they all make that guarantee that if you give us this information in this way, um, we'll, we'll deliver it such and such a way. So interfaces, it turns out contracts, and then there's many implementations for them. So you'll see there's many, there's many implementations of a set. There's sets that are well suited to different circumstances, but they all make the same promises. They all provide, deliver on their guarantees. It's just that they do so with different levels of efficiency. Okay. Um, efficiency in terms of how fast they are, efficiency in terms of how big they are. And it turns out Java supports a, a rich set of collections built in. Um, so that it, it comes with a lot of collections that are made possible. So I'm going to talk about a variety of collections available in Java here. Um, and give sort of a whirlwind tour of some of the more popular ones. Um, so perhaps the most popular, most ancient of these, um, and arguably the most widely used, is something called arrays. Um, an array is something that uh, can be created to store a, a sequential set of items, and they're indexed by numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, so the 0th item is the first, the one, item number 1 is the second, etc. So this is an example of an array here. And Java actually provides some nice syntax for creating arrays. So if we wanted an array of city names in Maine, um, we, we could provide 
describe them in this sort of way with these curly brackets. If we wanted an array of uh, of, num of numbers, um, say the first ten prime numbers or something like that, um, uh, we could provide that in an array. You know, with, uh, arguably one, two, three, five, seven, etc. Just list it out here. In which case, instead of being a string here, we'd say int. So this syntax basically with the with the um, square brackets basically says, okay, I want an array of strings. So um, if I if I have this variable array cities, if I apply this operator to it, to find the ith item, and that's how you indicate it, array of cities, and you put up say zero inside this bracket, I get back the string. That's what that sort of notation means as to why this is an array of strings. If you apply this to it, you get back the string. Okay. Um, and here's an array of <coughs> integers. Um, and here we're actually creating an array explicitly using this so-called new operator. So we have n items in an array that we're requesting. If n is 100, then we're going to have 100 items in an array that are going to be indexed through 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to 99. Um, so they're allocated using this or implicitly using this. So this new does a standing order? Sorry? New does a standing order of integers? OK. So, so um, new creates an array. And I'll, I'll use this board over, over here. Um, apologies for twisting some people's, um, some people's heads. But uh, new here is basically going to create a, a structure that looks something like this. Um, and conceptually, at least, what you're going to have is particular numbers. So this is saying, create me uh, an array of length n uh, here. So this could be n of these, whatever n is. So Maybe should be defined before, right? Uh, n needs to have a particular value at this point. Yeah, like it, so maybe it's 10, maybe it's 100, maybe it's 1,000. Um, it has to hold some, some value. This is n here. And this would be, if you want to find out the value that's here, Let's call, let's say this array is called uh, array um, n. Um, array null out. If we wanted to find this one, we would use this syntax, array n of 0, like that. Um, if we want to find this one here, we would use array, array n of 1. Huh? And this guy up here would be array
Java arrays, they're special. They're special because they're, they're something that Java knows about from the very language definition. They're not merely another class. They're, they're actually something special in the language. There's special syntax associated with them, special way of denoting them. Um, other, other types of collections uh, with uh, maybe no exceptions tend to be, maybe, maybe there's some exceptions I'm not thinking of, they, they tend to be just classes that are useful, that are, that are useful and have been defined at one point or another. Okay, so these are Java arrays. Does that make sense to people? But, but so do you have to say new? Can you say just uh, array new, uh, array neighbor indices uh, in, in brackets says 500 or whatever? In, in other words, if, if yeah. you said 500 yeah. here, no, that was a problem. Okay. Because this, I, um, so, so people here are from different levels of background. So I'm going to say some things. Sometimes it will bore some people. I'm going to say things. Sometimes it will it'll go over the head of others. And, and forgive me. But if, if I said 500 here, mm -hmm. um, what you're actually uh, this this is actually this is a is a statement about the type of array neighbor neighbor indices. And uh, I don't believe Java. There's a set of different C-like languages. Different rules, but I don't think Java allows that mm -hmm. just to put 500 here because I don't think it allows that as part of the type information that is mm -hmm. some length 500. I could be wrong about that, but um, I don't remember that as part of the Java language specification mm -hmm. that you can have the type uh, that you could have the 500 here. The key thing is that this whole thing is saying that array neighbor indices is something that when you, if you were to take that and you were to apply to like look up in that index with a number here, you would get back an int. Mm -hmm. right? that's, that's what that means. And so by extension, this thing is an array of integers. That, that's really what this whole thing is sort of saying. Um, and this whole thing is saying that this is an array of strings because if you put a zero in here, you get back a string, for example. You put a one in here, you get back a string. That's just a declaration <coughs> of the type of this. Now, what's the value of that? That's given over, mm -hmm. over here, and that's something that's of length n, and and it's a it's an integer array. But you um, don't actually give a value here; you just initialize it. Right? Well, this is a this is this is a value. This is creating a reference to an array. But you're correct that the array is initially uninitialized. It doesn't contain a particular set of items initially. So these guys here, to avoid confusing people, we could put those in later. But initially, when that springs into being, um, like Athena from the mm -hmm. head of um, Zeus or what have you, there's nothing in there. Yeah. Like, since I can create, since I can create the array at the same time I'm ready to populate, is there any advantage for creating it early and just kind of having it hanging out there? Um. Or, or do you want to do it just in time? So I right. get to a point and, okay, now I need an array. I create my array now. Yeah. This is yeah. way back at the very start of my project. Right. But I begin to break it down and work. Oh, okay, so it's a great question. Generally speaking, um, just in time is, is, is good because it means that you carry the mem. So, so this takes up memory, folks. And if n is, if n is 3, like it is so here, implicitly, it doesn't really take much memory. If the n is three million, it actually sucks up. You could see the, you, you, it's like Ross Perot put that here. You can hear the <laughs> sort of the, the sound of the memory being sucked up, um, you know, from, from your computer. Um, those of a certain age remember what I'm talking about. And, and uh, you know, here, here it will take up memory. And so um, if you allocate it early, uh, that's sometimes convenient because kind of you get like all your housekeeping work done early. It's like okay, everything's you know everything that needs to be done is, is all set. And now I'll just go and do the work for it. It's like everything is laid out. You have all the cars you need. You have all the hotel reservations before you go fly a country. Con you know, suppose you were gonna go between here, drive from here to San Francisco. You might, for the sake of um, sort of peace of mind and just having clarity on exactly where you were going each night. You might like to have your hotel reservations all made, your 
all the cars that you're going to be renting along the way, all the reservations done. So nothing, un nothing surprising happens, right? Um, like, let's suppose you were to go between here and, and San Francisco, and you didn't do that, you might find that some night you have to sleep in the back of your car or something like that, or you, you have to wait around. And so sometimes it's nice to get those things all done up front. You know you've got all the resources you need. The problem is it carries the memory for longer than you, you need to. Um, or to put it another way, um, this isn't the way ho how hotel works but in this country, but maybe they charge you, you know, um, they take it out of your debit card or your credit card immediately, you know, they, and so your credit card will be hit with a lot of bills for, for um, a longer time. Here, here you'd actually be carrying the resources for a longer period of time, and, and that, um, that might not be so desirable. Like maybe, maybe uh, when the program's running, you could allocate one big array here, and then you get rid of it, and then you allocate another one later, and they could end up using that same space, reusing the space, so to speak. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in general that's desirable, but sometimes you like, conceptually speaking, you like the work to be, um, to be done up front. You know, what I'd say is it's a matter of pragmatics. It's a matter of pragmatics. And so if it's a small array and it's simpler for you to think about it and it's less risk of error, do it up front. If it's a, if it's a big, big array, then you might want to really think about waiting till you need it unless there's a, there's, there's a good reason not to. Unless there's a compelling reason, to do this thing up front so that we're sure we have all the memory before we get started in the process. Because you don't want to get halfway through and discover, oh, you don't have the resources you need. That's a bad thing. Um, okay, so here are some trade-offs with these arrays. Um, you can easily specify the initial contents. You could easily specify an array of these things, right? Um, that's I like these names in, in, in main. It's a simple syntax. Um, I won't go into the box that unlocks elements, but it can contain ints as well as references to integers. Um, and those are slightly different, it turns out. Um, the cons is, this is the most important one I'll, I'll draw attention to. Um, this fast lookup should be up there. Con is, it's painful to extend or delete elements. Like if I had these things and I wanted to delete Portland from this list, um, there's no really quick way to do it. What I'd have to do is sort of allocate a new array and copy, copy the items I still wanted, and consolidate it. I can't really shrink it and grow it. It's kind of like having a house underground. It's great, it's protected from the vagaries of the weather and so on, but if you need to expand it, it's a big pain. It's a big pain. So uh, uh, yeah, there's an algorithm of shrinking. So if you wanted to delete the middle element, you could create a new array of Size the old one minus one. I guess they are sort of predefined or aren't they predefined in the class library somewhere because they're so popular in public store and all that stuff, so the same shrinking for Yeah, so uh it wouldn't be used with, with uh, bubble sort, but um, th th there, there are. So there's uh, something called array lists, which do allow you to do that very readily and provide that extra flexibility. In arrays, they don't provide that flexibility. It's just not part of their contract. Um, uh, here you can only have integer indices. We'll come back to this, but the point is I can't look up someone's name. I can't say, this is an array so that if I look up their name, you give me the information on them. You can't really do that. You have to you have to look things up by integer. So, okay, what's at the zeroth one? The one, the first, the second, the third. Um, and um, that's that's a bit of a restriction. We'll we'll see how we can relax that with things like hash maps and, and hash tables. Okay. So a second one is is array lists that I want to talk about. Okay. So I, I talked about arrays. Array list is a is actually a, a class and has a very different syntax. This is not built into Java language. Provided in Java libraries, and it has this sort of syntax. So this is an array list that stores integers. This is an array list that stores strings, and it's like an array, but it allows rapid insertion and deletion of elements. And uh, like a normal array, you can request things at a certain index, but you can also um, you can also um, you know, insert and delete uh, quite quite nicely. Um, so it kind of combines good aspects of an array and one called a, a link list that we'll get to in a minute. Um, and the suggestion here is, look, use a built-in array if you know the size ahead of time. But if you're going to be adding items to it, like you're going to be over time accumulating items on here, like 
how many items are to be in there? If you know the, what the n is here, that's a certain value, then use this instead. Uh, don't use, a, use an array list uh, unless you need that flexibility because they're going to be a little bit slower, have a li little bit more overhead associated with them. This is, this is an array list. Um, and incidentally, you will see in, in uh, here, array list is the first item. So these are sort of the practical choices that, that you have. Um, turns out that, that um, the population, when you have main class and there's a population in there, it's represented with a sort of array list. Okay, sort of a specialized array list, but it's the same basic uh, principle as, as an array list. You can add things to it, you can delete things from it, you can um, itemize it. Oh, one thing I should say with an array list. Given the population is an array list, um, you have to be a bit careful if the population size is growing and shrinking. Let's suppose you have one person in the population who dies. If, if you know that Joe is at item number 100 in this list, if you know they're person 100 in this population, when the population shrinks, let's suppose Joe's know, uh, grandfather passes away, he may not be anymore at item 100. He may now be at item 99 or something like that. So you've got to be a bit careful when you have an array list, sort of assuming you that people stay at the same position. It might be actually fluctuating. With an array, you don't have to worry about that. Yeah? Do I have the capability to find before I yeah. say that it's shrinking and whatever, yeah. but before I do something with Joe, do I have the capability to find his element number? For yes. And then call that specific one? Or is that? Yeah, so in other words. Making my life miserable. Okay. My friend Andy. Uh, no, so you can do that, yes. Um, generally, you don't have to. Like, if you want to know, is Joe person 100, person 100, 101, or 102, yes, you can actually do that. Generally speaking, um, we don't typically have to remember who's at what position. Because we just, whatever's at that position, just have a reference to them, and we're just working with references to them. So we don't really need to remember that he's at position 100, but occasionally it comes up. Um, it comes up. Um, and if you're interpreting any logic output, it will sometimes come up because people's names in any logic, um, people's names in any logic, if you turn them into a string, that's what's given. Their, their, name, their name is given as the position in the population. Um, so um, uh, I don't know. Um, it's it's tempting to um, uh, to try to illustrate this with a with a uh, with an example here. Let me just um, here's here's an ABM model with birth death. Um, you can open this up if anyone wants to follow me with this. But um, what I'm going to do is. Uh, I'm going to set this so that when I click on a person's representation visually, it prints their name. Oh, oh yeah, it's, um, huh. that's weird. Yeah, um, maybe. Let's. Um, yeah. Um, ooh, 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 ooh. Um, uh, maybe you could pass me that, that box there because uh, my memory is getting uh, getting lower. Right. Okay. So let's 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 go change this resolution. Um, pardon me while we break for a non-commercial message. Um, okay. So. Um, Okay, yes, yeah, so 12, okay, that's probably a bit too much. Um, I don't know, this is probably more. You wouldn't have thought, though, that, um, yeah, let's do this one. That looks, that looks better. Okay. Um, thank you for pointing that out, sir. Okay, so how would, I, how would I have it, if I wanted to set this so that when I click on their visual representation, it prints their name, it prints their string representation, how would I do that in, in any logic? Where would I go? So if I click on them, I want it to print out who they are. Where would I do that? Good. It's associated with the person because somehow it's, you're asking about a property of.
of them. You're asking them to do something, a particular person. So it's probably something to do with person. And where would it be with person? It's an event. And it's an event that would be associated with what sort of thing about them? Is it an event associated with their state chart? With their visual representation. And where lives, wherein lives their visual representation? Sorry? Circle? Yeah, it's the circle up there. Um, that's kind of their, their, um, their, their uh, what they look like, their physical manifestation or their visual manifestation. So we go up there, and where do I go now? Dynamic. dynamic yeah, yeah. And if we go to dynamic, remember this, this whole thing with, with sort of circle size, uh, you can adjust. But um, if we want it, if we want to have it, so when I click on it, it does something, where would I go? There we go. Okay. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay. In fact, I already have something there. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, let's, let's go have it um, print them out, though. So um, one way to do this with trace LN, and all I have to do is say trace LN of this, okay? Um, to be more pedantic about it, I could say trace uh, this dot to string. So I'm going to turn myself into a string representation. In other words, this is kind of going to give my representation as a, as a, as a string, as a, as a set of characters. So I'm going to do that. And, um, and then let's, let's, let's run it. OK, that's a good question. Could I pop up a little dialog box or something? Um, there are ways to do it, yes. Uh, for simplicity. Yeah. Yeah. I, OK, so, so this is going, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, this is going awful fast, so I'm going to slow it down. So I'm going to, um, OK, there we go. So I actually just clicked on this. And here you, um, here you actually see the, uh, the printout here. This root dot population uh, 1103. Um, uh, this is actually their name, okay? Root population 1103. That's, that's sort of their serial number. Um, uh, and, and we, um, that's how it sort of reports who they are. Now, that's all fine and good, but, um, you know, and, and if, if we, hey, hey, if we click around, okay, come on, um, hey, why, why aren't you, why aren't you, oh, there we go, okay, I, I guess I was clicking on the, maybe on the, on the connection, here we, here we are, so there's their serial number, the problem is, if people are dying, their serial number could in fact change, it's like their position in the list, so just because it says 355 here, maybe after this, it would say 354, or something like that, depending on, well, let's see, yeah, this is occurring before them, so they'd probably be moved back. So what I'm saying is that's their name, and don't, don't come to rely on that as their unique ID, because if people are dying and being removed from the population, this might now be 354 below them. Does that make sense, mm -hmm. people? So you've got to be a bit cautious in using that as their name. When this person dies, maybe, maybe we'll just take a look at that. What happens when a person dies? What do you think happens mechanistically in the model when a person dies? Um, I'm not getting into theology here, but what what happens in the model? Don't we need to see the state chart for the agent? Okay. To, to let it give us an insight. Okay, so. So they go into the, so when they die, they're sick in that, in that dead death. That's, that's right. They go to the death state. And when when they go to that death state, there's something that actually happens. Here it calls finalized death, um, and if you if you go to finalized death here, it, it reports some information. That information we see, and then it calls this thing remove underbar population. Where does this name population come from here? It actually comes from knowing about what it's called in Maine. It actually, when you create a little um, thing called population here, it actually will go and it create a thing called remove population. Okay? And if we wanted to see that, 
we could go control J and we could go see, go look up, okay, this, this is um, remove population. Um, and let's, let's just go see where it's defined. This is the, the code for it. And if we want to see remove population, can we find it? Oh, oh um, looks like it, um, it's actually not listed here. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Well, that, doesn't, that makes sense. Why wouldn't it be here? I was toning up for a bit there. Why, why can't I find it here, remove population? It's in Maine. It's in Maine. Yeah, it's in Maine. So we're going to have to go up Maine and, and uh, go down Maine. And uh, let's do open with Java editor. And let's go in Maine and find this. Remove population. Here it is. Um, OK. Um, so first of all, it's saying population dot underbar remove. That's actually rem sucking it out of that array, I, I would bet you. It's sort of taking it out of there. And then it says object.set destroyed, which basically means, hey, person, treat yourself as destroyed. Um, uh, get rid of all information associated with you or what have you. So the point is that it both removes people from the embedded, see, removes a given embedded object from the replicated embedded object collection, and then the object is destroyed um, uh, after that, or it's set to be destroyed. Um, so it, it, it will be cleaned up. Uh, in any case, uh, the point is that it actually is going to remove it from that collection. So the numbers of other people may shift. It's, so I, I like, I might shift my number. Yeah. So then if there's a particular agent that you want to track, kind of their, how their trajectory, yeah. how they move through the state chart. Yeah. has to do with how much uh, you can rely on any logic's name versus your own mechanism. Um, so what thing, okay, so folks, let me, let me pardon, pardon me from um, uh, switching to a slightly different example, but because the population is big and we have lots and lots of people, I'm just going to switch this one that's already in the board here, okay? And again, I apologize for quirking people's nets. Um, so when we had this array of strings, so the population is like this array of strings in the sense that it's an array, it's an array list, but conceptually it's very, very similar of sort of successive cells where each one is a reference to a particular thing. And the population is a reference to a lot. What are these? Here they're what? In this case they are cities, they're, they are strings, right? For the population, these are references to what? Persons. Okay, so folks, um, what if, so what if we were dealing with an array list and, and um, <coughs> suppose that uh, these were persons here, um, if they're cities as agents or what have you, and we were to eliminate this middle one, okay? So maybe any logic calls this array city.
apparently, I I had this idea apparently two years ago looking at this because um, there's, <laughs> there's already a thing called stir name here, um, uh, and and in fact I anticipated myself, um, <laughs> which is, is I, I don't know I, I don't think um, you know this is. Uh, this is anything too deep, but um, looks like I already had a thing called next ID for new person and stir name, um, and I had get person name. Okay, um, so this is actually a more reliable name. So if I wanted to report their name as as dictated by uh, my own mechanism, and you you folks can go copy this if if you see fit. Um, when, when this is, instead of calling to string, I could say um, this dot get person, whoop, person name. Um, probably I should just call it get name because after all, if it's in the person class, I don't really need to say person. Um, um, but I could, I could make this instead be get person name. And then when I run this, um, uh, I could, uh, Instead, see, instead of saying root dot population whatever, so I'm going to slow this down again so we don't we don't get all that that stuff there. And then I'm going to click here, um, and you can see it says person 299, right? That that's that's actually not going to be adjusted by that's something they carry around that they're number 299 all throughout their life, and it, it's not affected by their position in the hierarchy. So in short, don't use any logic mechanism. Quick answer. I mean, any logic provides that as their default name, but you can always provide a thing that's like get name. That's a method you just call it directly to get there to get their name. Um, let me ask though, because this teaches an important lesson, and after all, we're trying to mix these lectures um, at, a, at a coarser grain level with discussions of models. But why not mix them at a fine grain level? How would I do that? How do you think I accomplish that thing up there? Um, yeah, yeah. How do I how do I sort of give them a unique ID? How would I do that? It hinges on something we talked about in fact last time. In fact, principles we talked about the past few times, maybe in maybe in different lectures, but it goes all in one. How how do you think that works? That I give them a unique name? How would I know that it's unique? person to person so we never give the same ID again. After all, we don't want two different people to be given the same ID. So what we actually do here is, where would that ID be associated? Is it a characteristic of each 
of each person? No, it could be a main, but an even more elegant place to put it is, is it associated with persons? Or is it associated with, is it associated with being a person that you have this idea? It is. So I would argue that the natural place for it is actually to be. But do you actually need them? Okay, so, so let's talk about alternatives. So, so the alternative would be like, and every time you want to assign the next um, mm -hmm. name, then you get an array size of the array of your current names, and then um, the last one. Okay. okay, so here there's no array of names. Though. But then, the, oh, the string, oh, the, the string. There's just, for okay. a particular yeah, person, yeah. each person has a string. Okay, yes, yeah, so I was thinking about an array of strings in the main. Okay, yeah, so you could have an array of strings in the main. That would be a fine way to do it. That would be a fine way to do it, and you could just maintain that. The problem is, generally speaking, as part of the philosophy of agent-based programming, and, and by extent, and more, more generally, part of the philosophy of object-oriented programming is, when we have a person, we want to store the information associated with a person with, sort of all together. Um, and that's one of the things that gives it an appeal is that like um, all the people associated with the city are stored in references from the city. Um, they're not, it's not stored all in a kind of um, spread out diffuse way where each person lists the city and we have no sort of no, we have no notion of co coherent place to go to for city information. Um, instead here we, we like to kind of group the information for each person. And so, if it's person-related information, we go to person. If, we, if it's deer-related information, we go to deer. And that makes it more modular, because if we want to add in not just a deer, but a moose to our model, or, or a, an elk, um, we can do it just by adding a new class, or if we want to take it out, we can do so directly, confine our model to deer. Um, we don't have to worry that it's spread out in a diffuse way across our across the model. Okay, so here, um, here what we have is uh, information for assigning this, and I'll, I'll tell you how it's done. I mean, in my mind, this could live in, in Maine, but where I put it was associated with person, but as a static quantity. What does this static mean? We talked about it, I think, last time. A static quantity, how is it different from a non-static? I argue that it's a bad term because static normally means it doesn't change over time, but here it means something different. Mm -hmm. No, it's not that it's not so much initialized, although it, it bears on, okay, so, so it's, not, it's not initialized each time a new person is created, that's true, but it's static information is associated with, with what? So, so this variable set, so this variable ethnicity, but, uh, this variable mother, this variable that says um, initial age, um, the, the color, those are associated with what? Each person, right? Each person might have a different value for ethnicity or sex, or mother or, or initial age. Um, I mean, some people have the same mother and so on, but by and large, these will differ. Their characteristics of a given person, right? This, this ID, the sort of next ID to give out, Ooh. up there, next ID mm -hmm. for new person. Is that a characteristic of a particular person? Yes. No, it's a characteristic though of person nets. So we associate it with person here, but we make it static. This is associated with the class, not the objects of that class. It's associated with personhood, but not with being, not with a particular person. So we call it a stack. Static one, just as we have static methods. Static methods have no this. Remember that? I said methods in general have a hidden parameter called this, with one exception. And that is static methods. Static methods are associated with a class. They don't have a this, but they're associated with personness or personhood. And so we, we, we call them static and they're just associated, they're grouped together with other things about person. So here, this ID that we increment successively for each new person that comes in, we're incrementing it. It's associated with personhood. And so it's, it's grouped in person here, but it's called static, okay? Um, 
And similarly, this function, this method, is called a static method. Whoa, whoa, come on, go over there. Um, static as well. Now this get person name, is that something which is going to operate on the characteristics of a person? Yeah, it's, it's, all it's going to return is str name. And this str name, its initial value is going to be the string person plus this get and increment next ID for new person. Okay, so it's going to call off to that method up there. And that method up there is going to simultaneously, this is one of these things where it's both computing a value and, re and changing something. It, it basically is going to return the current value for this and then it's going to increment that. And take care of it. So in short, every time someone comes into existence, their name is initialized to be the string person plus the results of this function call. And this function call is going to return the current name, the current ID, and it's going to increment that. And so this is a way of allocating new IDs over time. Okay? That I allocates new IDs to people over time. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, when we come back to the model, we'll actually see something to remind you a little bit of this, though it doesn't involve static quantities with computing the current age. This is a common need, and it turns out there's a lightweight mechanism for doing that. Okay, so in short, folks, um, uh, what we have here is uh, a way of allocating IDs, and this allows us to be impervious to this whole issue of reshuffling uh, th the shuffling of the population doesn't impact our name. We have a unique ID, and that ID is for name. Now, by the way, they also have a, this is their name, but we could give them a sort of, th they also have an ID. We could have saved around their ID as a number, a numeric quantity if we wanted to. So it would be an ID in a database or something like that. And we, so we could have also had a variable called ID. In which case, we don't even need a surname variable. We get person name could just return person concatenated with their ID. But if you, if you, if you, if you store the string name of the person, right, it doesn't give you any good in terms of reference to the person later in the model if you want to perform a certain manipulation with that particular. Correct. It, it, it actually. So then you still have to find it somehow among all the others in the population by looking through and comparing the name. Co the correct. So when. Um, sort of. I mean, yes, you could actually you have a hash a table. A uh, yes, you, yes, you could store a, a, a reference to them, but um, yes, and generally you would store a reference to them rather than having to loop through. But I think your point is that if you give them an ID, mm -hmm. a numeric ID, that would be that would be like a unique operational address by which you can get them, you get access to them. And then there's um, th that is somewhat true, but again, I mean, uh, you wouldn't be able to always look them up at that ID in the population, right? But yes, you could store an array of, of people according to when they got created and, and you know, never pull someone out of it, etc. Okay. Um, don't want to spend too long on this, but does that make sense to people? Does anyone want me to go into that more? Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so let's talk about a linked list. A linked list... I was only wondering, can you also create a point uh, Array of references to integers instead of integers themselves? Yes, you can. Um, yes, you can. And by and large, an array <coughs> is going to be. An array is the only one I know about where it's, this is built in, where you can actually have the integers in it. And um, by and large, you're going to be dealing. Um, you're going to be dealing with the collections where it's contained references. So you could have an array where these are references to integers, and they'd be called capital IMT instead of lowercase IMT. And those would uh, those would contain values here, um, like you know, like nine, five, etc. They would live outside of this array. This array would contain references. So they would like to the IMT lower case IMT. Correct. That's right. Um, that's a detail which I haven't really gotten into in this course, but it has to do with this notion of box and non box. Yeah. Um, in Java, generally, goes you can go between very readily. 
but they are different. Um, okay, um, so a linked list. Um, a linked list is, is a data structure that allows you to kind of go back and forth among the elements very readily and reorder the elements. So generally speaking, what it what it looks like, and I apologize for not having a, a nice picture of this as part of the slide, what it looks like is you have something like this. Uh, uh, and actually, in this case, because it's a doubly linked list, um, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just sort of simplify it and represent it like this. So there's a there's sort of some reference, maybe this is per some person, you know. Um, so this is some person one, and then there's going to be a reference to a person two and a person three here. Um, I'm, I'm sort of representing this in a somewhat more stylized way, and it should in detail sort of how things are laid out. But um, we we have this sort of ability to go from one element to the other. And in fact, it's a doubly allows you to do is to um, is to sort of go sequentially among these and reorder them. So like this can be put spliced in there and this over here. We can reverse the order, for example, um, very, very readily. Turns out that um, we can remove someone very easily here. Uh, so for example, if this one, if we want to remove it, we could remove this item here and all we'd have to do is sort of locally up. So this point's here and this point's there. And now we have a shorter thing. Whereas with an array, if we want to remove this guy, we'd have to copy all of these elements one over. Which is a bit of a thing. Okay. So a linked list is something that allows you to flexibly insert and delete things. Um, uh, and for example, we might want a linked list of history information of particular events that occurred in a person's history say people who have been infected in the order of infection occurrence. Okay? Um, another type of data structure is what's called a dictionary and a hash table or hash map are viable implementations of this. Okay, So I'm going to say hash table but I don't want to privilege that and hash hash map. Okay? Um, what a dictionary allows you to do is to look up keys. Okay, And these keys very importantly could be Strings. They could be uh, references to a person. They could be an integer. They could be a double. You can look it up and have some information on that key. So this allows you to implement what's sometimes called context index memory or, or associative arrays. So for example, um, uh, an array, you look up content and an integer. You say array n of 0 or a n, array n of 1. A dictionary, you can essentially say array n of Joe and find Joe's information. You could say array n of Portland and find Portland's information. Um, in other words, you can find information associated, say, with a string. Or you could say, uh, you know, uh, for this time, what was the value of, of this thing? Look up a double or what have you. Um, and so you have two collections associated with this collection. And a collection of values, but most typically you're map you're going from a key, you're finding the associated value for it. And the key could be a huge number of different different things. It, it, and for example, uh, oh, what am I doing? That should be there should be two things here: key, comma, value. So like string, comma, person. So if we had dictionary string, comma, person, that would be something which if we give it a string we can get back and the person associated with that string. So we could look up Joe and find the associated person. Okay? So the pros of this are we can insert things really quickly into it um, and, um, and we can basically find information, um, uh, associated information with, with a given key. Um, so we can insert quickly and we can, um, we can look things up by, by key the cons here, the bad side is that there's, there's um, well, there's, they're pretty limited. If you have a limited number of keys that are very, very similar, um, it may take longer time for insertions to take place. Um, and uh, it can be a larger data structure. It can take more space. If you have a really large number of items in it, like an item for everyone's name, who's the associate, a reference the associated person. So, uh, for example, we can look up city characteristics for names. Have, have the name of the different cities, and then you find the city agent associated with that. So 
this is a map. This is mapping from keys to, um, to information. Um, we're getting to the end of the list here that I'm going to be presenting, but another one is a set. And a set allows you to sort of dichotomously see is something in it or not. So this just stores a set of items. Um, maybe they're a set of persons. And you can ask, is this person a member of this set or not? There's no, or you can iterate over those that are. So there's no ordering of elements. Um, a linked list, you have a certain order. An array, you have a certain order. Um, here, you have no order between them. There's no, there's no order, privileged order by which one is, is in it before another. It forgets about what order you inserted them. And you can also perform set operations, like you can take the union of two sets or take the intersection of two sets. So you might have a set of people that um, you know have uh, been, in, been identified for contact tracing on the one hand, and a set of people who have been uh, infectious cases on the other. You can take their intersection, find the set of all contact traced people who have been cases. So those are intersections of sets, unions of sets. Uh, sets. Um, so a set abstracts away from what order things are in, and, and but can be useful to accumulate information. A priority queue is something that um, we'll uh, see in one of the examples. And so I'm, I'm talking about it here. And it's genuinely pretty useful. So um, we could have, for example, a set of people awaiting um, a process. Uh, maybe it's awaiting uh, diagnostic testing. Maybe it's awaiting treatment. Maybe it's awaiting contact tracing. Maybe it's awaiting, you know, the award of, of housing units. This this could be a queue. People are waiting for it in some sort of linear, some sort of linear fashion. So if they arrive sooner, perhaps they get treated. But there's an additional notion of priority. So you might have some people that are treated with higher priorities than others. So maybe, for example, children are given priority for contact tracing for TB compared to non-children because they're at higher risk. Or maybe those who have certain, um, uh, certain socioeconomic status are treated as higher priority, um, lower socioeconomic status, higher priority for housing because they have a greater need. Um, so here we have a sort of waiting line. And this represents our waiting line. But it's a waiting line like you might have in an airport where you have the first class and the economy line. And folks in the first class line, they arrive, they're treated first, boom. And the economy people have to wait for them, even if they've been waiting for half an hour. When someone from the first class arrives, they're treated first. Um, or when the pilots arrive for the, for the security, they just go right in. Um, yeah. Kind of makes you want to wear a hat, you know. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you know, people are treated with different priorities. So here we represent a waiting list. This can be really useful for models where there are waiting lists involved. Um, I've mentioned some examples. Another might, one might be organ transplants. You're awaiting an organ transplant. Um, so the attention here um, lies at, at the head of, of the, the list. That's where the action People are kind of moving up, but it's really at the head that that you know the real um, most of the action occurs. That you, you deal with the person who's at the head. You give them the treatment. You give them the diagnosis, testing. They get the organ transplant, what have you. So, the person at the head is dequeued. So basically, you can return a reference to that person or remove some from the head of the queue, or you can ask to peek at them. Just get their information without yet dequeuing them, without yet removing them from the queue. So priority queue um, can be uh, very, very helpful. I guess I should um, should note that with a priority queue, you could specify an arbitrary metric to prioritize people. So for, for persons, the thing that gives priority might be according to their age, it might be according to their history information, it might be according to how long they've been in line, it might be according to their, um, you know, to their weight or what have you, some risk factors. So 
one of the models we'll be looking at uses a priority queue to represent contact tracing. And people are ordered in different intervention schemes for contact tracing. Um, people are ordered by different characteristics or prioritized by different characteristics. Um, another model that, that we look at um, has treatment being meted out according to different characteristics of people. Um, where those characteristics might be most basically how long they've been waiting, but could also be uh, things based on like how many connections they have in a network, etc. And you can then treat people in that order. So this is very useful if you have limited resources and you want to treat people. Now, I should note that we've seen queues before. Where else in this semester have we seen a queue? They were implicit and they were hidden behind the scenes, but where else have we seen queues? Exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah, so when we were looking at the um, ophthalmology little example and the um, uh, more broadly, the, uh, the example of, a, of an emergency room, th there were queues all along the way. People might sometimes be awaiting a resource like a waiting room. In other times, they might be awaiting the arrival of a clinician. Um, here, and, and so uh, that sort of modeling, discrete event modeling, is very, very useful for its flexibility representing queues. What we can have with priority queues is the ability to represent those queues in agent-based, pure agent-based modeling. And that's sometimes useful for, for models that we'll see. Okay? And there's going to be a practical trade-off as to when you want to start hybridizing the two types of modeling. When do you want part of it to be using the discrete event modeling and part of it to be agent-based modeling? When do you just want to do it, say, in agent-based modeling? Okay. Um, this is priority queue. Um, now, it turns out that um, these are just some of the job functions. There's a number of, of additional ones, even in the list that any logic offers. Um, be aware that Java developers routinely create new so-called data structures. Often, they're composed of, of many sub-pieces. And they're often built out of these building blocks that we've just talked about. If you can acquire some comfort with the ones we've talked about, you'll get very, very far. Um, they, they introduce some, some of the, the main ideas. Um, be aware, though, if you build your collections, you have to be a little bit, um, little bit careful. Uh, I was typing this in a hurry, and I didn't, uh, didn't do a spell check, obviously. Um, but uh, two key things here is, if you have items within your collection, you directly pass out references to them. Um, they might be, the items inside of you might be modified by the person you give them by the code that you give them to outside. And similarly, if someone just passes in a reference, you just store away internally the reference to that thing. It might allow external code to modify, to modify those items. So you got to be a little bit uh, careful in terms of, of building collections with some pointers there. And I'm glad to provide more comments. Um, so these are Java collections. Um, I'd like to answer any questions we have on this.